used to look up in the sky and wonder at our place in the stars. Now we just look down and worry about our place in the dirt. This world's a treasure, Donald. It's been telling us to leave for a while now. Interstellar is a film of great apparent paradoxes. Humanity is able to survive a present apocalypse through the use of science they discover in the far future. They create the beacon which rescues their own race from annihilation. We'll discuss the scientific underpinnings of Interstellar, and I'll do my best at explaining why the paradox may not be so on today's video. When Christopher Nolan's Interstellar first released, general audiences were somewhat sour on the film, finding it to be a little too slow and overly ambitious, especially compared to some of his, at the time, recent crowd-pleasing work like Inception or the Dark Knight trilogy. Now, if you're watching and subscribed to this channel, the previous may not apply to you. And I'm sure many of you were moved by not just Hans Zimmer's beautiful music, but also the story. I always liked Interstellar's human elements as well. The bits people often called sappy or heavy-handed or even nonsensical. But now, we're past the 10th anniversary for Interstellar, and I think that general audiences even are viewing the film through a new lens as we slowly approach the future depicted by Nolan. Every year, it seems that Interstellar gains more fans and reappraisal as one of the most beloved science fiction films of the 21st century. And if you couldn't tell, I can't agree more. Interstellar is the epitome of a film which was ahead of its time, and not just in a critical sense, its ambition to be as scientifically accurate as possible has also received new levels of acclaim. That, along with the forward thinking in the world building, is what we'll be discussing today. The near-apocalyptic future world of Interstellar and the science behind the movie. Interstellar places us in 2067, on a dying Earth. Humanity has turned away from advancements and science generally in order to prioritize the dwindling resources of the planet due to the blight, which is a plague affecting plant life on Earth. Kip Thorne, a theoretical physicist and Interstellar's scientific consultant, explains in his book, The Science of Interstellar, that a real-world blight is possible but unlikely. Blight is a general term used for a disease which kills plants, and there have been strains and incidents of such blights in Earth's history, which have led to mass extinction of plant life. However, the conditions required for this to happen on a planetary scale are unlikely. The idea the film goes for with its possible blight is a mutation of a more specific blight strain which attacked chloroplasts a crucial organelle for a plant's photosynthesis. The specifics aren't important. What is, is that plants have been dying out across Earth with many staple foods and products completely impossible to grow, with some exceptions like corn, as we see. This is the general plot device which forces the characters to take action, but it's also worth discussing what happened in the 53 years between, at the time, real world 2014 and the film's near future of 2067. The character, Donald, protagonist Joe Cooper's father-in-law, acts as our audience surrogate, being born sometime in the 90s or early 2000s. He saw the world as it was, and his complacency represents how our current society will most likely, eventually, just accept humanity's inevitable extinction. We are told in the years following the blight that food riots swept the world, and during Cooper's youth, simple everyday things like sports were abandoned due to a lack of food. One of my favorite little bits of world building is when they go watch the New York Yankees play. It shows just how much Earth has degraded in a commercial and social sense. By 2067, things like meat are not readily available, and most of the population relies heavily on corn. This lack Lack of global resources led to at least one war, perhaps multiple, which spanned at least a decade and resulted in the dissolution of multiple military forces, including the US military, as well as other government agencies, including, most importantly for the plot, NASA. Not a whole lot is known about the wars of the 2030s and 40s, but one of the most interesting elements of the world building and its technology has to be robotic soldiers. Much like almost everything else about the world of Interstellar, we don't go too deep into the use of robots. We do, however, meet two different units, both of which get a four-letter designator. 
Tars and case. Like other technological advancements of the 2060s, robots are no longer being manufactured, at least not on the level of these two, though Cooper makes reference to grunts doing simple chores like vacuuming and yard work, but that seems a lot closer to the evolution of a modern day Roomba rather than the advanced computers and robotics we see and which seem to be evidence of humanity's technological advancement. One aspect of these robots which I've always really enjoyed is their fully formed personalities, some form of AI which contrasts with their very simple and mechanical designs. I mean, they're just massive rectangles with screens that maneuver in interesting ways, almost like a Rubik's Cube, folding and twisting on each of its axes to move in different ways suited to the environment, but the film does a good job of humanizing them. Why are the very human personalities contrasted with such clearly mechanical designs? Well, my original assumption was that it was a conscious choice to avoid an uncanny valley feeling. You know, you go out on a space mission with a robot that looks like a human and you pretty quickly get alien vibes. But another interesting idea is the fact that perhaps because of the war and the resource shortage, not a whole lot of thought or effort was put into the actual appearance of these robots. They were most likely quickly and pragmatically produced in order to get them on the battlefield. They're simple, durable, and designed with specific purposes. The two we meet are able to act effectively in their roles, ranging from security, piloting, and maintenance. And I would have loved to learn a bit more about this. How were robots used in battle? Were their models with mounted machine guns? Were they more aids to human soldiers? Who knows? But while the robots are interesting, people return to Interstellar because of the cosmic elements. Now, the physics of Interstellar is based on actual science, but much of it was speculative and used in a way to tell the story that Nolan wanted to tell. The approach the aforementioned science advisor Kip Thorne requested for the film was that the plot could never contradict real world science, but could speculate on the unknown. I brought it up before, but if you want a much more in-depth explanation, I highly recommend Thorne's book, The Science of Interstellar, where he discusses much of these behind the scenes details. The foundation for Interstellar's Lazarus mission lies in the discovery of an Einstein-Rosen bridge or wormhole orbiting Saturn which was discovered in 2019, 48 years before the events of the film. The hypothetical structure in our real world takes its name from physicists Albert Einstein and Nathan Rosen, who were key in developing the idea of an unnaturally occurring tunnel which would connect two separate points in space. The easiest explanation is the one used in the movie, and it's part of the reason why I think the movie is so great. It makes these scientific concepts really accessible. But fold a piece of paper and stick a pencil through the sheet. You've got two separate points points meeting by folded space. The idea is that because a wormhole cannot naturally occur, an unknown third party most likely intentionally put it there for humanity to discover. Just enough time for humanity to discover the wormhole and begin exploring the possibilities of searching it before the resource crisis began. Now, the placement of the wormhole is incredibly interesting and leads us to the film's perceived paradox. It's explained that future humans were responsible for placing the wormhole in Saturn's orbit, resulting in the Lazarus mission and humanity leaving the dying Earth. So humanity advanced to the point of being able to alter four-dimensional space, which itself is a bit far-fetched, but the explanations are rooted in actual science. The future humans of Interstellar exist in an extra-dimensional plane known as the bulk. This 5D plane of existence is beyond time and space, allowing for the evolved humans known as bulk beings to interact with the universe, though they are unable to manipulate matter in the third dimension. We see this at play in the movie's third act when Joe Cooper is able to communicate and receive a limited interpretation of the bulk through the use of a tesseract. The fifth dimensional beings can establish communication between space, our third dimension, and time through a tesseract. However, they are no longer able to perceive time in a chronological sense, which makes direct communication impossible without some sort of surrogate, which is where Cooper comes in. By the way, if you want to read more about the experience within higher and lower dimensions, consider checking out Flatland by Edwin Abbott. There's also a great segment from Cosmos where Carl Sagan talks about the fourth dimension. It's readily available on YouTube and also goes into some of the Flatland stuff. Anyway, the way Cooper experienced the Tesseract is as an infinite continuation of his daughter Murph's bookcase 
where he's only able to interact with his three-dimensional world through gravitic manipulation. So if the bulk beings can't directly interact or manipulate physical space, how does Cooper wind up in a construct of Murph's bedroom? Well, as Cooper says, gravity crosses through the dimensions and since gravity draws objects together, Cooper's connection to Murph is essentially pulling him to this location, making him act as a dimensional GPS. Since this is a dimension beyond time, Cooper sees the chronology of what he has known as if it were all occurring simultaneously. His actions within the three dimensions of the universe as we experience them are limited, he can't directly change or manipulate events as he experienced them, but is able to feed his point of origin with the necessary information to change his future. He or the bulk beings have created his destiny, their existence is dependent on Cooper fulfilling this prophecy while not contradicting the flow of time and also acting through his daughter Murphy. This is why as soon as all the pieces are in place, the Tesseract closes itself, ejecting Cooper to reunite with his daughter one last time and hopefully fulfilling the prophecy by reuniting with Dr. Brand on humanity's new host world. What did Cooper send back through the Tesseract? What did his daughter accomplish? Well, not just the habitable planets, but also data from within the singularity, which allowed for some form of gravity manipulation, allowing humanity to leave Earth. Basically, the film presents it as a gravity equation. I think that's all that really matters. Anyway, to continue our general discussion, you can see the speculative leap when things like destiny and prophecy enter the conversation, but Christopher Nolan and Kip Thorne wanted to tell this very otherworldly story while making it as plausible and possible within the real world parameters of science. And I'd say they did a pretty solid job. But if you watch the movie, or at least are watching this explainer, we have to talk about the paradox, or at least the sequence of events which us lower dimensional beings see as a paradox. Humanity needed the fifth dimensional beings to survive. However, how did humans become fifth dimensional beings without Cooper fulfilling the prophecy? They placed the wormhole, but how was there a they without the wormhole? There's really no simple answer for this, but I do think Murphy is a hint. Murphy's Law is the idea that anything which can happen will happen. I think we see this as a paradox because we don't see reality from a fifth dimensional perspective where things happen simultaneously and space time doesn't really exist the same way we perceive it. I generally don't subscribe to the idea that there were alternate timelines that this fifth dimensional version of humanity survived some other way, only to come back and make a better future for another timeline, nor do I subscribe to the notion that bulk beings are actually some form of alien. So I think you have to accept that for us who experience the universe in three dimensions, there is a paradox. But for five dimensional beings who, who have a different experience of not only time, but also whatever the fifth dimension and its architecture consist of, it allows this creation of a closed time loop where Cooper is sending himself the coordinates to NASA, where humanity is allowing humanity to survive. And really that's the great mystery of the film. That's I think how people incorporate love. Some who are religious probably would incorporate religion. But on a basic level, the way I see the movie is humans put the Tesseract there because they always put the Tesseract there. You'll have just as easy a time trying to think about what existed before the Big Bang. It's just not how it was. The way we perceive the universe through linear time is not, at least according to the movie and the theoretical science underpinning it, the true nature of reality. The existence of fifth dimensional beings isn't easily understood. Humanity survived because it was what happened in that part of the loop which sees the development of the fifth dimensional beings. It's what always happened, it's what needed to happen. There were no other options. You have to move away from the idea of there being a before and an after. Thankfully this is a problem that only really comes up when trying to understand science fiction movies and not in living our day-to-day -day life. I do also want to note, there being a closed loop or different perceptions of time does not remove the idea of free will. It doesn't make the universe of perhaps our own, but certainly interstellars, a deterministic one. Decisions made by free will can still fall within that loop. Either way, the collaboration of Nolan and Thorne, I think, has allowed Interstellar to toe the line of both fantasy and plausibility. This could have been just another space adventure movie focusing more on fiction, but Nolan's dedication to faithfully representing the actual science 
while then traveling into the speculative and the fantastic, has allowed Interstellar to continue to grow in appreciation in the 10 years since it first entered theaters. I also think the movie has done a pretty good job at popularizing physics and certain phenomenon like relativity in a nice pop science way. But the influence that Interstellar has had on its audience is going to continue to expand as time goes on or doesn't, and will hopefully generate more enthusiasm and interest in space travel and science. That's all for me. Until next time, I'll see you soon.